All right, coming up on this next segment, I'm going to be talking about Utah's young players and how I would rank them. Um, the players, we'll start with the players. Larry Markinen, Walker Kessler, Keontae George, Ochag Baji, Taylor Hendricks, Bryce Sensabaugh, Taylor Horton Tucker, and Colin Sexton. Those are the players. It's a pretty simple list. I believe all of them are about 26 and under. Um, so I'm going to be, there's a couple of criterias that I want to go into here. Um, a couple of ways that I want to evaluate them. First, I'm going to be looking kind of at their trade value. Um, what they mean to the franchise, how the fans value them and over just overall their, their overall value and production as a player and who I believe in the most. Um, that's kind of going to be the criteria. We'll start with the last, the last out of these. Um, just, just to refresh. The list is Laurie Markkinen, Walker Kessler, Keontae George, Otag Baji, Taylor Hendricks, Bryce Sensabaugh, Taylor Horton Tucker, and Colin Sexton. So last on this list, I have Taylor Horton Tucker. That shouldn't be too much of a surprise. Um, I've openly been a little bit of a critic of Taylor Horton Tucker. I feel like I've also been pretty fair in the way that I've analyzed him. I think he's had a lot of good moments for the Jazz, but he's also had some not so great moments for the Jazz. So it's it's interesting to dive into Taylor Horn Tucker. And end of the day, he's he's still twenty two. Like he will be twenty two on opening night next year. That's a that's big. The guy he's played in four seasons, played a total of 196 games. He has that under his belt. And you hope that as part of that, he's been able to learn a lot. Here's the thing though. We've we've watched we watched one season of Taylor Horton Tucker with the Jazz, a couple seasons with the Lakers. His first season he played in seven games or six games. People were excited about him. They thought he was gonna be like the next big thing for the Lakers. His second season he played honestly played pretty good for them. Uh played in sixty five games, started in four, averaged nine points, was just had a lot of flashes. And here's here's the big thing with Taylor Horton Tucker. If you watch a highlight reel of him, you're going to think he's a really good player because he takes and makes difficult shots. He does all the dunking. He is so flashy and so good in transition. Like, that's one thing I really do appreciate about Taylor Horton Tucker, and that's one reason I do think he has value is because of what, he, what he's able to add in transition as far as being a capable transition threat, a lob thrower. Like, he makes his best passes, best reads, best decisions when he's in transition. Granted, that's not very hard. Most people do. His third season is where things kind of started to turn down. And so like between, I think his second and third season, there were talks of trading him for like Fred Van Vliet, that the Lakers would be able to get Fred Van Vliet for Taylor Horton Tucker and that the Lakers turned that down. I don't know the validity, the validity of those talks or how far they actually got. I'd be pretty surprised um, if they got that far because I mean, he hadn't really shown enough to like believe in him as a a franchise cornerstone. In my opinion, this last season with the Utah jazz, he played in 65 games, started in 20 of them played about 20 minutes per game. He averaged 10.7 minutes per game, um, 3.8 assists per game shot 41% from the field, 29% from three. He also averaged two turnovers per game. So almost four assists to two turnovers per game. There's things to like, and there's things to not like. Um, As far as productivity, it was his most productive season. He was given the third most minute, the second most minutes of his career. He played 1,313 minutes this last season. Um, The year before for the Lakers, he played 1,511 minutes. On a per 36 minute basis, he was the most productive he had been. Um, during his entire career. And we saw it. Jazz fans, we saw it. He would come in, come in off the bench. Um, He wouldn't come in every game. You kind of, at the beginning of the season, you had Mike Conley as your starting point guard, and then Colin Sexton would come in off the bench. And then you'd kind of had Nikhil Alexander-Walker playing ahead of Taylor Horton Tucker at times, and you'd have Taylor Horton Tucker playing at the two or at the three. Didn't have the ball in his hands a ton. However, as the season went on, As the Jazz traded Mike Conley, he got a lot more opportunities, especially when Colin Sexton got injured. 
and Taylor Horton Tucker essentially inserted himself into the starting lineup as a starting point guard. And as a starter, he was, he was okay. I mean, like the Jazz weren't doing great and he didn't, he wasn't doing great, but he was producing. I think that was one consistent thing about Taylor Horton Tucker is he was producing whenever he was playing. However, the production was never efficient and he was always making turnovers making poor decisions. And that's where I'm really scared about Taylor Horton Tucker in his future. I understand that he's 22, but at the same time, he's been in the league for 44 years. He's played in 196 games. There's some things that you expect somebody in their fourth year to be able to do reads that they should be able to make um, and just have a general sense of what their role is. I talked about this a little bit because we don't know. And maybe Taylor Horton Tucker doesn't even know what his role is. I think it's hard to value him. So for that reason, I have him last on this list. In second to last, I have Bryce Sensabaugh. I'm not going to dive too much into Bryce Sensabaugh. I'll just say this. Um, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give him a fair chance because he deserves it. He was one of the best shooters in college basketball last year, if not the best. I mean, go look at his shot chart. It's just insane. He was incredibly efficient, taking really hard shots, was really good last year. My big thing with him is I just I don't know about how durable he's going to be. It made me nervous that he didn't play in any of summer league. Granted, Taylor Hendricks didn't either, and I do have Taylor Hendricks a little bit higher on this list. Um, I'm also worried about his defense. I think defense is going to be crucial for him to be able to earn minutes. And lastly, I just I'm I don't know about how much opportunity he's going to get on the Jazz. Um. I would expect he starts the season in the summer league, plays a lot of summer league minutes. Hopefully he's able to ball out. I think there are certain things you can ask him to do. You can ask him to really work on the defense. And hey, to his credit, he has said that he feels like he's improved on defense since the season began. So I'm I'm putting a little bit of stock into that. I want to see what he can do. I want to see how, he, how good of a defender he can be. Because if he turns into even like a, C minus defender, which isn't great, but good enough to be able to play and justify his offensive production, then I'm all in. I want I want to see him play. I want to see what he can do. But if he's not at that level, then I think it's hard to justify him getting real NBA minutes. So I have him second to last. More than anything, it's just I have, I have question marks, and I'm sure being able to watch him play and see what he could do could answer a lot of those question marks. Next on the list, this might surprise some people. Um, and look, I'll just I'll preface this by saying the Jazz has a pretty nice young core. There's a lot to be excited about. But I don't, I don't want to make anybody mad. I just I want to I want to get into Ochai Baji. He I have him third to last on this list. Um, I think we know what Ochai is. I think he's going to be a really good, probably not great, role player. And I think he's going to fit his role. I think he knows what his role is. I love I love that about him. He projects to be a 3 and D player from pretty much this point on, on out. Somebody that can also... Look, he's not just taking threes. He is a good cutter. He's pretty good off the ball. I think he can do a little bit of driving. So that's where I'm kind of like, okay, I like that. But as far as like expanding his game outside of that, I don't I don't know how much we're gonna see. I talked about this last week, so I won't hammer this too hard. I just wish we would have seen more from a playmaking creation standpoint out of summer league. Um, it's raised some question marks for me. I don't know how. Like I said, I I want my two guard, which I think is gonna be his best position. I want my two guard to be able to create. And I don't know at this point if he's going to be somebody that is able to create. And maybe that's fine. Maybe the Jazz are able to luck into somebody that can handle 35 minutes on the ball. But end of the day, I just I would have liked to see more from him. Um, I think there's there were some real growing pains last season. There's a reason that it took a minute and some trades for him to get a real spot in the rotation. But this next year, I think he will have a real spot in the rotation. And I think we'll be able to get a much better idea of the type of player that he is. The three-point shooting was fantastic in summer league. I, I thought it was great. He 
looks like a really good, confident three-point shooter. That's something that he showed a little bit of in college, but when I watched him, I thought he was, he was for the most part, a kind of mid-range shooter, attacking the basket kind of guy. Seeing him as a good three-point shooter is really intriguing to me, and I think that's going to be something that keeps him in the league for a long time. That, along with his defense, I'm curious to see how he develops as a defender, but right now he's looking like he is on the fast track to become a good defender. So I have him third to last on the list. Next, Colin Sexton. I, I, I'm I high on Colin Sexton. I, I've kind of talked myself into it. Maybe, maybe I'm being unrealistic. Maybe I have some bias, but I, I, I'm just a believer. You just, you look back two seasons. 2020, 20, 2020 to 21. He played 60 games, was a starter for 60 games. I mean, he's been a starter for most of his career. This for this last season was the first season that he came off the bench for the majority of the games. He's been a starter for most of his career. And I really do think that the role change probably was difficult for him. The reason I'm putting stock into him and into the player that he can be, there's a couple reasons. First off, I think last year was really crucial for his development. I think it was crucial for him to learn some winning habits as far as being a playmaker, his decision-making, which overall he kind of improved. There's a lot to like there. I also think he kind of understands the player that he needs to be from a shooting perspective. We didn't see him taking crazy shots. I thought, for the most part, his game was pretty in control, especially from the shooting and shot creation perspective. Um it was more of the playmaking as well as some of the attacking the basket stuff that was more questionable. But I do think he has to leverage his ability to attack the basket, and that's something that he has to use on a game-to-game basis. So I'm totally fine with it. Overall, like I'm I'm high on Colin Sexton. I I think he has a chance at being a good player. He's going to be put into the starting lineup. That would be my assumption on night one. He will have opportunities to be the lead playmaker, to run the offense, to facilitate. And that's where he's going to be able to prove himself. I believe in his ability to prove himself because in the few minutes, the few games we saw him as a starter last season, he was able to do that. He was able to facilitate. Granted, the roster was broken. Um, and it wasn't looking very good, and they were losing games. Those few games that I think from Colin Sexton's perspective, there was a lot to like. So my question now is, okay, how is he going to look playing with Jordan Clarkson and Laurie Markkinen and Walker Kessler and John Collins, and then bring in Kelly Olynyk? You're you're going to have guys with talent around him, and I think that's going to be the biggest thing for him to be able to be productive, to be able to be a good facilitator and playmaker. I think that's where we're going to see it shine. I'm really excited about Colin Sexton. I do think this is probably the make or break year as far as determining what he can be, whether he can be get to sort of a star level player, really productive point guard in the NBA, or if he's going to be kind of a guy that projects to be a six man for the rest of his career. I think this season is the season where you can determine a lot of those things. Coming up after a little break, we will be talking about my top four. Not going to give it away, but two rookies, one Finnish man, and one first-team all-rookie from last year. Okay, I gave my bottom four out of the eight. Taylor Horton Tucker at the bottom, then Bryce Sensabaugh, then Ochai Baji, and then Colin Sexton. Moving on to the top four. Starting with the fourth on that list, I have Taylor Hendricks. Like I like I like Taylor Hendricks a lot. I would have loved to see him in summer league, to see what he could do against NBA competition. Um, one of the reasons I think he is maybe a tricky evaluation is because of the conference he's playing in. The AAC isn't a bad conference. Um, he's playing against good teams like that Houston team is really good. That Memphis team was really good. Both of those teams were pretty good in the NCAA tournament. I just I'm I'm curious about his role because 
when he was playing at UCF, he was pretty much the first option. He's playing the most minutes, taking the most shots, was shooting the best. Um, I mean, he's scoring the most for them. That's not what his role projects to be in the NBA. I like, if Jazz fans don't know this yet, I don't think Taylor Hendricks is going to be that kind of a player where he's creating a lot. And I don't even know if he's going to be asked to do that. Like, I, I, I'm I, pretty hesitant about that. The reason I'm high on him is the mix of defense and shooting. I mean, we're looking at a league where basketball has changed so much. Um, having a four or a five that can stretch the floor and that can defend different positions, that's what you're looking for especially at this stage in the draft, like at number nine, while there might've been star level players available, like Cam Whitmore, I think the jazz, what they're trying to draft is just the most value and the most sure thing. I don't know if Taylor Hendricks is going to be on the jazz for his entire career. He might not even be on the jazz next season. If the jazz trade makes some sort of big trade, he's a guy that you could throw out. He's also a guy that you could keep, though, because, like I said, I think he projects to be a high-level role player. Somebody like Jaden McDaniels on the Timberwolves, I think that's kind of where his... That's probably the pedigree of player that he falls into um, as far as being, like, a shooter, defender. That's probably what he's going to be able to make money on. That's not necessarily the sexiest piece in a trade. Like, let's say the Dallas Mavericks want to trade... Luka Doncic to the Jazz and Luka asks out and he says he only wants to go to the Jazz we got like a little Damian Lillard situation here if it comes down to Keontae George and Taylor Hendricks being the center piece of that trade if I'm Dallas I would say Keontae George because of his overall upside and his ability to be potentially a franchise guy whereas I don't think Taylor Hendricks necessarily has that potential So that mix of not necessarily having that potential while also, I mean, he doesn't have that potential, but also just maybe isn't the caliber of player that Keontae George could be. I think that puts him at number four behind some of these other guys. At number three, fitting because it's his jersey number, I have Keontae George. My big thing, the big reason I didn't put him higher, while some might want to put him higher, they might want to put him number one or number two. I personally think that's a little bit crazy and premature. My big thing with him is how do we evaluate his summer league? Because there's kind of two different sections. And we saw what he did in Utah in the Salt Lake Summer League. He was great. Played pretty good through three games. Felt like he had a good control of the offense. Felt like he looked comfortable. What was even more impressive was when he got to Vegas. And I almost think he looked like a different player. Like, I thought he looked pretty good in Utah. And I thought he had a lot of flashes. When he got to Vegas, though, he absolutely took over games and had a complete control over the game. Looked very confident as a playmaker and a point guard. My big question is, is that just a hot stretch or is that who he really is? to be able to determine whether that was just a hot stretch or if that's who Keontae George is, I think we just need a bigger sample size. That's why I wish we would have been able to see a little bit more of him in Vegas. Uh, that third game of Summer League versus the Clippers, he wasn't looking as great. He had he had plays. He had plays. Don't get me wrong. He had an incredible ankle breaker. He had a really nice pass to Micah Potter that I still visualize on a daily basis. But I don't know if he was necessarily as productive that game as he was those first two games. And that's fine. It's it's one game, you know. Um, maybe the player that we saw in those first two games is a lot more indicative of the player that he's going to be. Either way, I think you can walk out of Summer League and see the potential and see the upside and see what kind of a player he could potentially develop into and evolve into given the opportunity, given um, opportunities to improve and opportunities to be in difficult situations, I think he can prove a lot. 
overall, I'm I'm really high on Keontae George. Having him number three on this list is in no way a bad thing. Um, just looking at the two players above, the production's already there. They've already been able to prove something on an in an, an NBA environment. So that that's 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 my big holdup with Keontae George. I just want to see him in an NBA environment. I want to see if he can um, improve more and be able to show more. I'm excited to dive more into Keontae George. Uh, don't even worry. There will be more episodes. We will talk so much more about Keontae George. I'm excited to do some rewatches of what he was able to do in Summer League and get a good idea of how good of a player he is because – I mean, if you if you watch Summer League, you know. Like, he seriously looked in control of a couple of those games. And I think that's where the attractiveness comes with Keontae George, is that ability to control the game. Number two. Look, I battled between number one and number two, and people might call me crazy for battling between number one and number two because one was an all-star last year while the other was first-team all-rookie. Like, you would think the all-star starter would be the obvious choice. I don't know if it is. Um, look, maybe it's the offseason talking, but I think we need to have a conversation about Larry Markkinen because it's possible. I'm not saying it's the most likely outcome, but I do think it is possible he doesn't have the same season he had last season. Larry Markkinen, like, I don't ever think he's been a bad NBA player especially when you dive into the stats, like he produces when he's on the floor. It's kind of the thing with Omer Yurtsevin, where I believe he his production has been pretty uniform throughout his career, even though he hasn't gotten the same opportunities through those two years. I think it's very similar to Larry Markkinen and the opportunities he was able to get in Chicago and Cleveland in Utah. There are a couple of things that do make me high on Larry Markkinen. And just to be clear, I have Larry Markkinen number two on my list. Um, there's a couple things that come into that. I'll, I'll, I'll get into that. So this last season for the Utah Jazz, just an incredible season when you look at it. He averaged 25.6 points per game, 8.6 rebounds per game, shot 49% from the field, and 39% from three, 87.5% from free throw. Incredibly p- productive from a shooting and scoring perspective. Um, there's a lot that I really like about Larry Markinen. I think his efficiency as a shooter and being thrust into a situation where he pretty quickly determined him pretty quickly was able to establish himself as the number one option on an okay team, a team that had a winning record for a lot of the season. There, That's a lot to like. There's so much to like there. Um, I also just, he looks different. You watch him on Cleveland. Go go through some of his tape last year. He looks skinnier. The handle wasn't as good. Um, I mean, he's been, a, he's been a solid shooter his entire career. He's a career 37% shooter from, from three. Um, in Cleveland, he was thrust into a position where he was playing the three. He was guarding threes, very similarly to what he did in Utah. I actually really think that was crucial for his development as a player. It's kind of like he found his his role. Um, I think it's the same thing with Christoph Porzingis, where, look, Larry Markkinen's first couple seasons in Chicago were super productive, as were Christoph Porzingis' first couple seasons in New York. There was a lot to like about him. He thought he was going to be really good. Then he went to Dallas, and Larry kind of moved to the bench in Cle- in Chicago, um, stopped producing at the same rate, had a really rough year, especially in 2020 to 21. Chris Stapps went to Dallas. He had a really rough couple years with Luka. Like, they just never had the synergy. He looked out of place. It didn't look like a great fit. And then he goes to Washington, where it was a much better fit. He was able to produce a lot more. I think it's a, it's a very similar case with Laurie Markkinen. Um, some players have a lot of talent, and they just need the right fit as well as the right opportunity. And I think Laurie Markkinen had the right opportunity last season. Looking at the Jazz this next year and kind of what they project to be, I don't know if Laurie Markkinen is going to be able to get the same amount of touches that he got last season. You have 
Colin Sexton taking shots. You have Jordan Clarkson taking shots. You have John Collins taking shots. You have Walker Kessler out there taking shots. I do think Laurie Markin is still your number one option. I don't think that's crazy. Is he your number one shot creator, though? Probably not. I wouldn't say that he's a better shot creator than Jordan Clarkson. And so that's where that's where I'm hesitant. I just I'm curious to see how much opportunity he gets. I don't think Mike Conley was as big of a factor in this as people think. Um, the Jazz's system, the way that they're able to run, Mike Conley did a lot. Don't get me wrong. I think he was able to really thrive as a playmaker. What strikes me out, what strikes out about the Jazz um, and kind of how they run their offense is the off-ball movement. And some of the ways that they were able to create open shots for Larry Markkinen is really impressive. One specific play that comes in, comes to mind that they ran so many times this last season is a pin down screen on either side. So Larry typically starts like either in the corner or kind of under the basket or kind of between the corner and the basket. And a defender comes, sets a screen on his guy, and then he gets the ball in the mid-range. Sometimes he takes it off the dribble. Sometimes he takes a mid-range shot. Sometimes he'll go all the way out to the three and shoot a screen and shoot a, shoot, shoot a three. Um, so I don't think Larry Markkinen's production is going to go down because he's not getting the same looks because there's no Mike Conley. I think he's going to get very similar looks. I just don't know if he's going to be the same focal point that he was. So that's one reason that I might be a little bit lower on Larry Markkinen um, than Walker Kessler, for example. Another reason is going to be the contract. And I think the contract is the big thing. Larry Markkinen could be making a lot of money had he made an, an all NBA team this last season. I don't think he'll have the same opportunity to make an all NBA team. Maybe he does prove me wrong. I would love for him to prove me wrong, but I don't know if he'll necessarily have that same opportunity. However, the contract could still get very large and could still get to a number where it's almost kind of scary. Um, and he might not be as a productive enough player to justify getting that kind of money. That's, that's my fear. And for that reason, I have, I have him number two on this list. I I would love to hear counter arguments. Please prove me wrong. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to have a different opinion, not just for the sake of having a different opinion, but because I actually think Walker Kessler might have more value going forward. People talk about Walker Kessler. They talk about centers, especially rim protecting centers. And the big thing you'll hear Jazz fans say, and this is fair, but the big thing you'll hear them say is, well, is he going to be able to stay on the court in a playoff series? We watched, we watched a couple years of the playoffs. We watched the Jazz go against a good Clippers team and beat them, send them home, and the Lob City franchise, and then take on the Warriors with Kevin Durant. The next year, they beat the Thunder in the first round, and then they played a really good Rockets team. A Rockets team that I believe went to the conference semifinals and took, or conference finals and took the Golden State Warriors to seven games. Or maybe that might have been the year after. Either way, they lost to that same team, essentially. Then they lose to the Denver Nuggets in the in the bubble. Don't think that was because of Rudy Gobert. I just think that was an incredible circumstance where I mean, the Jazz, they did blow a 3-1 lead. The big one that stands out is against the Los Angeles Clippers. That's a series that everybody's going to point to when they talk about a rim-protecting center not being able to play in a, in the playoffs. You can play a rim-protecting center in the playoffs. The Bucks have played Brooke Lopez. Um... There have been other rim protecting centers that you're able to play. Anthony Davis, he's had no problem. Granted, I don't think Walker Kessler is going to get to the level of defensive player that Anthony Davis currently is, because I don't know if Walker Kessler has that type of mobility in him. But you're able to play, play rim protecting centers. Um, what they need to be able to do is be able to punish opposing teams on the other side of on the other side of the floor. If you're playing your traditional five-man lineup with a big center in the middle and the other team play throws out their small ball lineup to try and spread you out, how's how's your team going to respond? There's kind of two ways I think you can attack it. Um, first of all, you can just 
keep playing those five. And if they're able to defend well enough on a on an individual basis and if they're able to stretch the floor, more importantly, if they're able to switch um, and be able to defend, then I think you can absolutely get away with that. The other side is the offensive side. If teams go small against you and you have a guy that is able to break down defenses because he's bigger than the defenses, which Walker Kessler is. You can't put Terrence Mann on Walker Kessler and expect Walker Kessler to do nothing. Granted, Walker Kessler hasn't shown a ton of self-creation out of the post. I do think he is and projects to be a better offensive player, more well-rounded, better out of the post player than Rudy Gobert does. And so that's where I'm buying into Walker Kessler. The other part is I just I think he's going to add more to his game. We saw one season of him. He played in 40 games. He started in 40 games, excuse me. He played in 74 games. He played 23 minutes per game. He was incredibly productive in those 23 minutes per game. Shot 72% from the field. 9 points per game. 8.4 rebounds per game, 3 offensive rebounds per game, 2.3 blocks per game. Like, he, on, on a minute-to-minute basis, he's producing a ton. I think he's going to be able to continue to do, be on that same traje- trajectory while also expanding more to his game. One of the things I really like about him is how he operates as a passer. Another thing that you need in playoff settings is somebody that's able to operate as a passer. If Walker Kessler can not necessarily run the offense, but not stagnate the offense by being somebody you can go to in dribble handoff situations or being somebody that can swing the ball, then I think he absolutely will have no problem playing in the playoffs. And he has shown so far that he's able to do that. A lot of times he'll be the role man and he'll get the ball kind of in the mid post and he throws out a good kickout pass. Like watch that next season. Watch what he's able to do. He's going to be an okay passer and somebody that is always going to keep defensive defenses honest somebody that can find the open man a lot of the time and somebody that is able to understand defensive schemes because he's such a brilliant defender himself like i i honestly think we saw a little bit of this with rudy gobert a lot of times with rudy gobert he would make some of those really good passes i was kind of waiting for the day when rudy gobert would get a triple double when he would get 10 assists but never happened Rudy Gobert made some really good passes, made some really good reads. I think Walker Kessler can be even better at that just because of his general coordination and because he's able to show some of the understanding of defense at such a young age. So that's where I buy into Walker Kessler. Look, I don't I don't know if he could ever be your best player on the team. Could Larry Markinen? I don't I don't think so. Could Walker Kessler be your second best player? I think it depends on who your first best player is, but I also think he's going to be a guy that leads teams to top 10 defenses on a perennial yearly basis. He's going to be really hard to play against, and I think he's only going to get better and better. I'm really excited for year two of Walker Kessler. Maybe it's a down year. Maybe I'm totally wrong, and maybe he has way more value, but I think he has more value than Laurie Markkinen. Coming up, one last segment to finish this podcast off. We're going to be talking about one reason that I think the Utah Jazz could be a playoff team next year.